Hi, this is Tracy Eaton of Remarkable Franchises, here today to welcome you to Franchise Conversations. And you're in for a real treat today because we have Grant Jones here, um, who's the CEO of Massage Club Australia. And Grant has had an illustrious career in franchise in, at all levels, uh, as franchisee, master franchisee, franchisor, um, as well as working with SMEs as well. So. Um, let me just give you a little bit of a rundown on Grant's history. So he first started in franchise as a franchisee of Eagle Boys Dialer Pizza in Orange in New South Wales, converting it from an independent pizza shop. And then he moved to WA to become the master franchisee for Eagle Boys and developed that franchise network to over 20 plus Eagle Boys pizzas, um, pizza units before selling that back to the franchisor. He's worked with Fastway Couriers Global as their European Franchise Manager, helping them expand, yes, in Europe, but also North Africa and Canada. He's been an Executive Director on the board for the Master Franchisor for Fastway Couriers in the UK. He's even worked for an oil and gas exploring company, um, working with their investor communications and relationships. And he, Grant has had his own um, consultancy as well to small, medium businesses, of course, with a particular focus on licensing and franchising. And then most recently, he's developed the concept for Massage Club Australia, launching it here in WA with the first clinic um, in May 2012. And he's now the CEO working on expanding Massage Club Australia to the Eastern Seaboard as well. Not only all of this, Grant's been on the FCA, the Franchise Council of Australia's committee, uh, when he moved to WA and very quickly became the WA chapter president and as a result also held a position on the Australian board as a, as a director. So Grant, I can't believe you've achieved all this in a relatively short period of time, really, like, you know, in a, what, about 25 years or something like that. So welcome to you, and I look forward to asking you some interesting questions. So are you ready? Yeah, thanks for the introduction. It sounds great when you read it back, but it was a lot harder doing it, that's for sure. That's right. 25, 25 years condensed into a couple of, in a couple of minutes, if only. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Grant. Well, thanks very much for joining me today. And so we're really looking at what's going on in the franchise um, sector and some of the changes that are going on. So we're really interested to hear your, your view. So first of all, Grant, what do you do to stay abreast of, of changes and trends to ensure that your business, Massage Club, continues to be viable, relevant, and also an ongoing concern? And then secondary to that is, how does that then flow onto your franchise network? I think, uh one of the things I've learned a long time ago, and I guess a lot of everything I say comes from experiences that I've had in the past. And in the Eagle Boys days, I was preached at quite a lot by my franchisor about needing to spend time in the field. Mm -hmm. And coming from being in the field originally as a franchisee and then becoming a master franchisee, you brought a lot of the, the knowledge of what you needed to do. But in hindsight, it's a great thing. And whilst uh, we used to butt heads over it a bit and I was never spending enough time in the field, Realistically, it's the best place to get the true answers of what's going on with your marketplace. So culturally at Massage Club, since we've started, we've always had an involvement at a clinic level. And even myself now, even in the role of CEO, as we're going into the expansion aspirations, and everything that we're trying to put together at the moment, I still spend a day a week in a clinic. And to the extent that even more recently, we've put that in, I wouldn't say the words compulsory because it's your own business, but as in on the schedule, answering telephones, booking in clients, checking out clients. And there's no better way to find out what's working than actually being in the coalface. And we all hear about flyers don't work these days. It's gotta be digital, it's gotta be Facebook, it's gotta be this, this, and this. Well, when you get in there and you actually talk to your clients one-on-one -on -one and you go, how did you find out about us? It's quite, not surprising, but it's quite traditional what the answers are, which is referrals, uh, someone else told them about us. In regards to what happens in the industry, well, for me, it's, it's difficult because I'm not a massage therapist. And so, therefore, I bring to the business the fundamentals of business, but not the understanding of massage. And so, through listening to your therapists, which are the people that do, you know, we've got up to 600 hours of massage a week, so there's no one more qualified than the people that are actually doing it. 
talking to your clients, feedback forms, reviews, and also through the industry. So we do a lot of uh, training with Challenge and Take. Uh, we're also doing some work with the AIF at the moment now, which is Australian Institute of Fitness, probably the two most regarded educators in the industry. And so that also helps keep us a bridge of what's changing. And there have been some pretty big changes in the last few months. Yeah, absolutely, Grant. That's fabulous. And actually, that leads me to um, another question um, you know, with regards to investing in your franchisees and your team. And as you mentioned, you do that um, quite, you do that very heavily and believe very strongly in it. Um, so you've mentioned some of the things that you're doing with the ongoing um, training and professional development of your um, therapists and also your franchisees. So what have you seen as the, I guess, the impact of being able, of investing in your franchisees and the team then? Well, our business is a massage business, that's no secret, but it also enjoys a questionable reputation, massage in Australia. A lot of that's because of a mining boom and lots of people aren't sure exactly what goes on in all massage locations. So when we started the business, when, when it was originally being conceptualised, we had no way of measuring what was good massage or bad massage because none of us who were involved were therapists. So we introduced uh, a process of someone to work at massage club had to be qualified. Now it's turned out to be one of our biggest KPIs because if you don't have your cert for a massage, not beauty, but beauty you can get it a day, but a cert for a massage is an expensive course that takes several months and requires considerable hands-on hours of massage. So therefore, what happens is people have to be certified to work with us. So that's wiped out a lot of the people in the marketplace who don't have qualifications. But when you actually are certified, there's a thing called continuing education points that you need to earn per, per year to keep the certification current. And the educators run, facilitate different courses that therapists have to attend. Since we started, what we've done is put in place what we call the Workplace Training Initiative, whereas we put on four events a year that are hosted by, at the moment, uh, the Challenge of TAFE do it for us, so it's a government organisation. And each of the therapists that attend actually get five CPE. So therefore, across the four events, they can actually maintain their certification and they don't have to pay for it. So it's, a, it's an event that we put on at our cost. Uh, the therapists aren't paid to attend, so they invest their time to do so. We found culturally to be an important thing, whereas only yesterday I was contacted by one of the clinics to go, hey, when's our next session? So that... Continuing education is something we're going to carry right across the group. We're now realising as we're starting to see our plans for growth that having one facility or one meeting every three months is just not possible because we have 55 therapists working across the group now. If you want, we can only facilitate about 15 to 16 per event. So we're now looking at increasing the hosting two events and also geographically split. So, yeah, we see that as a big way to keep our team uh, a benefit of working here. Otherwise, to attend those events themselves actually end up being $100 to $300 each time. It's quite expensive to maintain this certification. Yeah, great. I mean, so awesome to be able to invest, uh, invest not only in the people in your business, but also in your, in your customers at the same, at the same time, um, also raising the standard of massage across, across the board, which is, which is really important and awesome. Um, Speaking of sort of being able to continue, um, yeah, something that's been crossing our minds recently, which is about um, uh, consumer fad behaviours. Now, given that some franchise networks are being impacted by those fad behaviours from consumers, and, you know, my mind, I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, my mind comes to, I guess, fad diets, fad fast foods, things like that. So what's your take on the massage industry? And as a franchisor, what is it that you're doing um, to ensure that you're not a fad and that you're actually, you know, that Massage Club is not a fad and that it's a sustainable network that will grow and live into the, into the future? Yeah, it's a good question and it's quite a topical question at the moment. I'll be careful with my answer so I don't single out any particular um, brands, but there's a all, all a fad is, I think, is, is it's something that's temporary. I think that's what, to, to me, that's what it means. And then when, you, when we look at an industry like massage, and what excited me about getting involved in this business is massage is something that's existed for centuries. It's everywhere, and you look around, but you can't see a brand. And so, therefore, there's nothing that you can actually trust. And so, there's lots of questions of what goes on in this massage place. Is it a parlor? Is it this? So we have massage clinics, not parlors. 
we have massage therapists, not masseuses. And there's a particular marketing element attached to that. But with fads, it's when I go back to the pizza industry, well, pizza, the industry itself is a core industry. It's a stable food. It's one of the most popular foods in Australia. I think we know that. But we've seen different things over the years come into the industry, be it pizza by the slice, pizza by this. Uh, you can get, um, we've brought in ribs, we've brought in chicken wings. There's been so many different things that have been tried. But fundamentally, these fads or these themes give you a reason to come back and try what the core product is. Mm -hmm. With Massage Club, our core industry is there and there might be fancy chairs that you can buy for between, you, know, you buy them for $7,000 and then two years later they're worth $500. You park them next to your bread maker and your thermomix. But the reality is that the core function of what we do comes back to a qualified therapist okay? and a, or a very experienced therapist. It can't be replicated online. So we see ourselves as a portal to massage and technology has a big impact on our business and we're nearly 25% of our volume is now done online. However, it's not facilitated online. And I think the internet's no longer a fad. Uh, the internet boom of the 90s is now here. I think we've all realised that because we now spend more online than we probably do in the traditional sense. But I don't see... Yeah, hence our conversation today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. We're, we're on Zoom, you know, and I've had to download it to do this, so I thought it was only Skype, and that's how quick things change. So I think with fads, you've got to look at how long will it last? And I'm seeing, you know, this whole casual dining section, which is great, you see new food opportunities that come out, and they take off, and everyone goes there, because everyone wants to try something new. But then, sometimes the cracks start to form. You see it, and there's, everything. at the moment, we've seen a lot of uprising float tanks, and things like that, which is all great, but none of them are new. They've all been here before. And so I'm not accusing them of being a fad by any way, shape or form, but it's just when you're looking at any franchise system, you've got to really look at what else is. And so we've, we can fall back to massage. Now we may expand into facials or we may expand into chiropractors or physiotherapy or add compliments to our business or, or as a fad comes in, introduce it and then take it away. But the core thing that we do is an industry in itself and that's what we're trying to protect by actually attaching a brand to it so when people think about a massage they think massage clubs so they don't worry about whether they're qualified or not qualified or why they're doing massages at nine o'clock at night we don't do massages at nine o'clock at night and people have worked that out and so therefore we're about looking after our clients and of course our members so i think as a to protect ourselves from being a fad is stick to what our core business is which is quality massage that's fantastic, Grant. And, you know, I mean, that whole going into an industry that is you know, very, very old, um, very, very well known, and actually turning it into, well, I guess the first brand that's really going to be well known is, um, is excellent. So thank you so much for that. Um, yes. Well, it takes me back briefly just to when I joined the pizza industry, it was the same. Yes. Pizza was everywhere, but there was one brand in Australia, Pizza Hut. Mm. And it was all dominated by independence and individual operators. And in came this concept of delivery, which mm. was new from the States. Then all of a sudden, 10 years later, there's a thousand franchise pizza stores in Australia. Mm. Same thing's just happened with 24 hour gyms. There's now a thousand 24 hour gyms in Australia. And I actually see the recent Ibis report, which has come out, says massage in the States is the biggest industry for the next five years. We're eight years behind them. So I think that there's a good, there's a good roadmap in front of us. We've just got to stick to the plan. Yeah, excellent. And congratulations on that too. Yeah, and, and um, you yeah, know, the expansion coming up is very is very exciting for you. I've got um two more questions, but I'm actually gonna roll them into well, one, because you'll probably want to answer them or you may want to answer them together. So I guess first of all, what's your view on the biggest issue that the franchise sector will face, in your opinion, for the next five years? And then also, what are the things that the franchise sector should be considering to be more sustainable and future fit so that they keep going after that? Interesting. Um, there's a lot of media at the moment. There's no way to hide from it, particularly around what's happened with 7-Eleven. I don't know anyone from 7-Eleven. I go there as a consumer because they sell Krispy Kremes and my daughter and I are addicts. But the whole focus through this whole process has been what I found quite alarming is it's no surprise. It's like, it seems like a lot more people know about what's going on. And I've, I've found the whole, the whole situation to be very distracting. Franchising is supposed to be a community. Okay? And it's actually driving divisions between the different. We've always tried to 
uh, particularly when I was involved with the Franchise Council of Australia, I know it's the intention now is to try and bring franchisors and franchisees together. So all this is very negative towards what we're trying to do. But I'm more worried about it being a distraction in the sense the responsibility to ensure your franchisees are paying the right wages. Yeah, you can say it rests with your franchisees and the legal agreements and all of say that might get that. But fundamentally, your brand and a system should have its own protections in place to do that. So whether it does or doesn't do it, that's your own issue. But as a whole industry, we're distracted by this issue about what's happening as a sector. And I actually personally see such, having recently moved back to Australia five years ago from Europe, one thing I really noticed was a strong, um, I'm not sure how to articulate it correctly other than back to the local community. And so I think the word community should be applied to franchising because it's about everyone involved, but there's a big drive anti-chain. And I actually see as a threat to the franchising industry, yeah, every, like, every time someone finds something wrong in a McDonald's, it goes global. The same thing you find at your local pub in their burger or at the local burger shop, it's not an issue. Of course, as you get larger, you become a target. You know, that, that's just a, it's a, it's a growing pain you've got to realise. But there just seems to be a trend back to local communities. And I know from the Eagle Boys days, I know from the Fastway days, I know from our business now, that those operators who are the most active in their local communities are always the best. And when that people start alienating you just because you're big, I think that's a real threat. So it's about educating franchisors that being a part of your community is really, really important. You look at ad funds that most franchise networks have, they're normally weighted 75 or 80% to a national fund or 20 to 30% to a local fund. And with digital and all these things, I just see that twisting a little bit. And I just think maybe that if you need to support the great local operators because no longer just chucking a brand out in front of your business works, doesn't. Just every town's got an incredible coffee shop that's doing 30 or 40 or 50 grand a week. And it's not one of the big boys. It's a cleverly, unusually located independent that's run by really, really good people. And once upon a time, it was the, the brand that would come in and chuck in the bit location and do really, really well. So I think there's just a need to behave like a community a little bit more and then start getting more involved in the community. And I, I don't know how we can do that strategically, but it has to be done with intent because if you pretend to be a part of your local community, your local community bites back really quickly if you're not. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that on that grant. And it's really interesting. The more that the more that everything becomes global and digital, and everything's moving so fast, um, fully agree with you that that bringing back to that local and that community and the human element, and of course that's one of the things that we're extremely passionate about in, in remarkable franchises is really going to be the key in this digital digital age um, to remaining relevant and yeah, not to be distracted as you say. So yeah, that whole distraction um, could well be um, something that will, you know, could harm harm um, the, the sector, as you, as you said, not just individual franchise networks. And so yeah, bringing it back to that local and that personalization, I truly do believe, is um, absolutely, absolutely key. Yeah. yeah what wages is the big issue. It's no secret, it's the elephant in the room. And, but Australia's got the ward wage system to protect people. Okay, some groups have regional prize bargaining agreements or they refer, they're called many different things. And that's okay. But it, things change. Award rates increase every year. EBA should be changing in tune with that. And if they're not, well, fundamentally, if you don't look after your people, they'll vote with their feet. And so these organisations who, there's some ethical issues, it's hard to comment on those because that's intricate. But if you're not looking after your people, they'll leave. We've learned that in our business. If we don't treat our therapists well and make sure that they are in an environment they enjoy working, they'll leave, same as our clients. And I think we vote with our feet a lot more now. And there's such a different adjudication system because of the way technology is. Facebook can bury you in a day or Snapchat's the next upcoming one. We've got what Twitter can do. And so therefore, if your clients aren't happy, you gotta listen. And if your therapists aren't happy or your team members aren't happy, you have to listen and pay. Well, it's a part of it. It's not always about money. It's about the environment they work. But there's, there's a lot of foundation of what a lot of been going on, but I sincerely think it's very distracting from what we should be doing as a community. Now, that's one word I'd love to see used so much more 
in the, across franchising as a, as a whole, for communities within individual systems and also communities of us as an association. Yep. As I said, we couldn't agree more with you, Grant. Listen, I'd like to thank you so much for, your, for being so candid and joining us uh, today for Franchise Conversations. And I know that um, you know, people watching this will learn so much and really you've given people a lot of food for thought. And thank you so much for sharing, um, sharing your thoughts and your pearls of wisdom, which you have, which is such a, a vast array of experience. So it's been a delight and thank you so much. Okay, so I have You're most welcome.